Hello, I'll be starting the uh, webinar here at about 2.30. Uh, thanks to all who joined me so far and hope you enjoy it once I begin. All right, so it's about 2.30 here uh, and I'll be getting started. So my name's Adam Gill. Uh, I am currently a meteorologist at the National Weather Service in Binghamton, uh, but formerly I worked at the Mount Washington Observatory for a few years and I got to experience some of the weather that, got, uh, that occurs up there and I want to share some of that experiences with uh, the people attending here today. All right, so Mount Washington Observatory to start, let's see here, there we go. So let's begin with like, what is the Mount Washington Observatory? So it is located on top of Mount Washington, North Central New Hampshire. Um, it's, it is a nonprofit research organization, so it is standalone. Um, so we do work with the National Weather Service with our weather observations and our resident to help increase the amount of data that is acquired in uh, Central New Hampshire. Um, we've been in operation since 1932, and it's currently one of the few mountaintop weather stations in the world that is staffed 24-7. Uh, 
it, her, it has one of the longest unbroken climate records of any station. And kind of what we mean by that is uh, we still do weather observations the same way that we started them in 1932 using handheld instrumentation along with modern digital instrumentation. So actually, when I was there, we have two congruent um, climate records, one that is digital and one that is still manual. Um, it is the highest point in the Northeast at 6,288 feet and is known as the world's worst observed weather. And the reason that we put in observed is largely because there is most likely some location in the world that does experience worse weather, but it's just not observed. Um, and also we have some scientific backing as to why uh, we have the world's worst weather with the combination of the extreme of the high winds, the cold and the snow, um, combining those all together and then ranking each climate station um, based off of snowfall, temperature, and wind, a lot of times we end up at the top of that list each year. Um, so we're located in the Sherman Abs building on the summit of Mount Washington. So the observatory is actually located in this tiny corner um, of the building on the summit. Uh, we occupy about 3,000 square feet uh, when you live there, and it has the instrument tower, and then on the main floor is the office space, and then down in the, uh, the basement of the building was the living quarters. Uh, the rest of the summit was the New Hampshire State Park. Um, so this area of the building was open to the public. And if you visit the summit, you'll be able to go in this area. And there's a snacks you can buy. And, um, but the location where the observatory is is off limits to the public because it is where we live. So, But that always stop people from walking in sometimes. They so had some uh, intruders on a pretty regular basis. So here's what our office space looks like. Um, it's pretty general. Uh, we have a couple of workstations, um, and this is the only picture I actually have of inside the office. Um, I'm not sure what was going on. I was back during my internship uh, back in 2015, um, but it's pretty general. Uh, this is our weather wall. So this is all of our instrumentation that we have on the summit, and it just puts it all in a nice location for visuals um, that we can look at all the data and record it. So to see what everything is, we have our High-speed wind chart, which has a calibration for 50 to 285 mile an hour winds. Our moderate wind chart, which is 15 to 140 mile an hour winds, and our two paper barographs that we still use. Our digital barometer, which is a bit more modern. And we also still had a mercury barometer and spirit mercury thermometers, which we still, uh, every four days, would um, use a mercury thermometer to check our calibration of our barographs. So we still use a lot of old school instruments. So like I said, we still did of uh, things like we originally did in the 1930s, as well as also using more digital instrumentation. Heading down to our living quarters, this is our living room. Um, I picked this scene since it's uh, Christmassy and festive, uh, but it's pretty, it, we have a TV, books, lots of books in the background there, along with a lot of DVDs too for watching movies. Uh, we didn't really have access to um, uh, general TV programming, but with the internet, with the modern age, we can have Netflix and whatnot. So uh, we did have some modern conveniences. Um, and then moving on into the kitchen. So that's a couple of our volunteers that we had when I was up there. Um, they would help out with cooking um, dinner in the evening and come up for our shifts. And then our bunk room, since we lived and worked up there, that's kind of like what the bunk rooms look like. Uh, each bunk room had three to four beds in it, and we had five bunk rooms total and could sleep up to 17 people in our living quarters. So it got really packed, given that it was a really tiny area. We had all 17 people up on the summit at once. And then I'm heading to our staff. Uh, we had two rotating crews that worked a week on, week off schedule, Wednesday to Wednesday. Um, so that's the last staff picture I participated in before I moved to Binghamton here. Um, so in the back row, we have Tom Padham, who is an education observer, then me, and then Jay, who was an editor, and um, AJ, Ian, Ryan, and Becca. So Becca was our summit operations manager, so she didn't stay on the summit all the time, but the six, six other of us did. Um, and so the positions that we had were staff meteorologist, IT specialist, and then those are the times, 5 p.m. to 5 a.m. for the staff meteorologist, then the IT specialist and education specialist are both day shifts, so 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then when we had interns on the summit, they worked 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then, of course, Marty the cat, who's probably the most famous uh, being on the summit, since uh, people are always intrigued by a cat living on the summit. So overall, what we did is we took hourly weather observations. All of us had to become METAR certified. Um, and we actually still recorded observations on pen and paper. And so that is what the top uh, picture is there. And we have all of our paper copies all the way back to 1935. 
um, sitting in drawers uh, in the weather room. Um, and my intern project when I was doing my internship there was actually to digitize as much of this as we can. And it took 10 years of full-time interns to be able to com complete that task. And they also do have real-time weather data. So let me pull this up here. So currently on the summit, it's 32 degrees, uh, getting wind gusts all the way up to 81 miles an hour. That was as of 2.35 p.m. Um, so it's pretty gusty with the winds going uh, basically from zero all the way to 80. So I still check this page on a pretty regular basis and can see the winds ramping up. So there must be a storm coming in here with 0.2 inches of snow so far today. All right, so since we're not always doing weather observations, since it only took about five uh, to 10 minutes per hour, we still have the rest of the hour to work on other tasks. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, so this is what the, uh, so this is what the instruments that we use still. So down in the corner here, we have our uh, sling psychrometer, which up there in the corner is me using it to record the temperature and relative humidity. So you swing that around um, and for about five minutes or so until the, uh, down in the corner you have a dry bulb, which is a regular mercury thermometer and a wet bulb that has a wick on it. And the, a temperature of evapor the difference between the temperature of evaporation and the ambient air temperature is where, how we got our uh, temperature and relative humidity. Then our paper barograph would just trace the pressure over time along with the inches of mercury. So we use that to, for our hourly observations. And then we have our wind chart up in the middle. So uh, we recorded winds on a paper chart that rotate around for 24 hours, and then would plot what the winds look like for the day. And then other things that we did is each of us specialized in a task. So the staff meteorologist was the main forecaster as well as data quality control by making sure that all the information we recorded between our paper copy and our digital copies are the same. So that way we don't have um, discrepancies between the two data sets. Um, our education specialists, where they would teach distance learning. So there's Tom down there, he's uh, teaching a class um, to remotely to um, local schools and even as far away as Australia. And then IT specialists usually helps with the coding and instrument maintenance and installation. And then interns just help out with daily tasks, really. So this is a very common question we had in the summer times. It's be like, oh, my weather station in the backyard records all the information that you do. So why do we have to be staffed when it can be automated? Um, because it's our, we're only open during the summertime to the public. Uh, the weather is very tranquil relative to the rest of the year. Um, so it's an easy thing. It would be an easy thing to do if the weather stayed the way it did in the summer. But of course, winter is completely different. And uh, so far in our time there with all the product testing, we have not had a digital instrument survive the winter without any sort of maintenance. So in the summertime, it's pretty tranquil. The highest temperature is, uh, the average temperature is only 47.4 degrees. So we basically just have more of an extended spring that just jumps into fall and then we go right back into winter pretty quick. Um, the average wind speed in the summertime is 25.7 miles an hour. We get about 25.49 inches of rainfall in the summer, and then we average 1.1 inches of snow. Typically that falls in June, um, but also August is when you start to see our first snowfall of the year. So we're either gonna get snow in mid to early June or mid to late August. So July is the only month I was on the summit for in which I didn't see snowfall. And then our seasonal extremes, our highest temperature ever recorded was 72 degrees and our lowest temperature was eight degrees. So you never really quite escape the freezing cold temperatures even in the summertime with the snowiest month being 5.1. The highest wind we saw was 154 miles an hour in July, 1996. And actually this year we set a new August record at 147, which beat the previous 142 miles an hour uh, when um, the tropical storm is, uh, is yes, passed west of the summit. And then kind of going, jumping into pictures for the summertime, uh, we did get a period of greenery where the grass gr was green and uh, there, the flowers bloomed. A lot of times if it was a quiet day, uh, we would get out for hiking. So the other person on the day shift would take over the weather observations and uh, the other person would take like the afternoon off and go out for hikes. Uh, it was really unique. A lot of times you'd have many layers of clouds both below and above the summit. Um, so it was just really cool to be able to walk around and actually enjoy the outside before winter comes along where you're gonna be stuck inside for most of the period. 
We also had a lot of optical phenomena in the summertime. Had a lot of low fog develop in the morning times. And when the sun rose, it would cast your shadow. If you're on top of the tower, it would cast a shadow into the clouds below and create a rock inspector, which is uh, pretty common um, during the early morning or the evenings with uh, low stratus decks. And of course, undercast. Uh, a lot of times, since we have very, we're a very prominent peak, we are above the clouds on a pretty regular basis. So um, many times a week, we'll be above the clouds and get to look out down at a sea of clouds during sunrise. Then I have a time lapse here that I took uh, back when I worked nights. So the unique thing about this day was that we were going in and out of the clouds on a pretty regular basis. And when you're in the clouds, we had an east wind, but above the clouds, we had a northwest wind. So almost 180 degree wind shift, which made for really cool fluid dynamics where you have uh, Kelvin Helmholtz waves developing and then dissipating. And then it just really shows how fluid the atmosphere is. Um, this is my favorite sunrise time lapse that I took. As it's cool to see that the cooler, denser air from the east uh, spilling into some of the ravines there and the winds coming in over the top of it, creating the, those waves that you see in the, and undulations in the clouds. And then uh, probably the most exciting weather that we got to see in the summertime were thunderstorms. Um, so these would develop usually on the summit and then drift off to the east. So we never always, we pretty rarely got impacted directly by thunderstorms. Uh, that was one thing that was really unfortunate about working on the summit is that it always made or break thunderstorms. So you're very rare to actually have a thunderstorm hold, uh, hold together and hit the mountain or you watch them develop like this storm here just off to our east and then go down towards gray main and produce a bunch of th lightning and thunder. And it's per pretty often to watch them go and produce a lot of lightning, but was, I would prefer if they hit the summit. And then if they came in from the west uh, in the evenings, a lot of times there'd be cool, there'd be clouds that would bank up against the mountains, which would prevent any instability from forming. So by the time the thunderstorms made a coastal mountain, they would just dissipate. So it was just always unfortunate. But when they did hit the summit, it was pretty exciting. Um, so this was in the summer of 2017. We actually had a tornado worn um, storm, uh, previously tornado worn. It wasn't tornado worn at this moment anymore but it had a really nice shelf cloud coming into the summit that we got to look down at since the shelf, the, the top of the shelf cloud is about 4,000 feet and we were sitting at 6,000 feet. Um, so we actually, one of our interns at the time was able to get a time-lapse of these thunderstorms rolling in. So during the storm here, uh, we actually didn't have too much lightning, uh, but we did end up with um, we did end up with a direct strike to the summit, which is really exciting. Uh, that only happens a few times in my time up there, um, and it's really loud. Sometimes, if it's at night, can see the sparks from where the lightning struck. Uh, but sometimes it does cause problems, like we had lightning travel backwards through our ground wire one time and actually fry a bunch of our computers that we had in the summit after lightning struck the building directly. Uh, but here's kind of like a ground view of what thunderstorms look like. So I'm hoping that it looks like it's a little uh, laggy on my screen here. So hopefully it's going through uh, properly. But uh, a lot of times you have a lot of wind and rain, kind of acts like a hurricane on the summit. Uh, but when you aren't having bad weather, you do have a good view. So this is looking off to the east where we have, you can actually see the Atlantic Ocean um, uh, during this morning sunrise as the sun glints off the ocean there. But in the afternoon, there's hard to distinguish it from the land. And then our furthest 
visibility that we had was um, off to the west. We can actually see the outer Andacs in New York uh, with Whiteface being the furthest mountain visible to the naked eye at 129 miles away. So now getting into winter, um, this was the longest season on the summit, of course, uh, usually lasting from mid-October to mid-May is when we had a snowpack on the ground. So we start seeing accumulating snow, uh, usually sometime between uh, late the last week of October to the first couple weeks of November, and then the snow stays on the ground till mid-May. Uh, so what makes it so extreme? We have three factors. I'll get more into detail, but basically terrain, uh, since we are an isolated high peak and very prominent relative to our surroundings, and we are perpendicular to the mean wind. And then um, during the winter time, we have increasing winds aloft and then a lowering tropopause that will help accelerate winds in winter and then storm tracks. We have a lot of the storms that develop in the US will pass uh, over or near the summit at some point. Um, so the terrain influence, we have Mount Washington there in the center of the screen. Uh, the orientation of the mountain range is in a northeast direction with our predominant winds largely coming from the west northwest. Um, so that forces the air to flow up and over the mountain range. And then in the middle of the mountain range itself, there's actually a V-shaped notch um, in the higher peaks where we have 4,000 foot peaks to the north. And then to the southwest of the summit, we have four to 5,000 foot peaks. And that helps funnel low level moisture and creates, uh, enhances upslope snow across a presidential range, which happens to be at the tip of that V-shaped notch. And then winds over the mountain. So like in the summer, one of the reasons we don't experience high winds very often is that you have a very deep atmosphere or tropopause. So the tropopause acts like a lid and prevents air from going above it. Um, so it's, so during the summertime, when it's about 40,000 feet thick, it only compresses to about 34,000 feet as it passes over the summit, uh, which doesn't enhance the velocities too much. In the wintertime, the tropopause can drop down to about 10,000 feet and then it has to go through about a 4,000 foot gap as it passes over the summit. Um, so there is quite a bit more acceleration uh, with that tinier gap relative to the entire depth of the atmosphere. Um, and that's kind of like putting your finger over a garden hose and the wind has to really accelerate as it passes over the summit. And then uh, last but not least, this was an intern project actually done by um, Sam Weber, who works at the Salt Lake office now, uh, but we tracked all the closed low pressure systems that passed the United States between um, 1981 and 2010, and then put a bunch of best, about 30 best fit lines to all the tracks. So a lot of them pass uh, through New England, and since low pressure systems can be a couple hundred miles wide, a lot of those will at least will be have a glancing blow as it goes over by the summit. And then probably the most significant reason we see such extreme winds is rapid cyclogenesis. So with the Gulf Stream going up the coast, uh, you have a lot of storms really deepen quickly, which helps enhance uh, the low level wind speeds. And then Mount Washington's located right there. So we're kind of like on the very uh, Western edge of where it's climatologic the climatological maximum for um, some of the strongest storms in the Northern hemisphere during the winter season. So with extreme winds, since we are most known for those, uh, the highest wind speed we observed on the summit was 231 miles an hour on April 12, 1934. And it was a global record until 1996 when 200, when oh, Augusta 253 miles an hour is recorded in Cyclone Olivia. Our average wind speed, 35 miles an hour with the highest monthly average of 46 miles an hour. So basically we'd have a high wind warning for the average wind here in New York. Um, and then my personal record, the highest gust was 142 uh, miles an hour, and the highest experience outside was 137. Um, and we typically see hurricane force winds one out of two days in winter and 100 plus mile an hour days uh, one out of four days. So these are the anemometers that we use. The pitot tube was our main instrument. Um, the nice thing about the pitot tube is it has no moving parts and it measure, and actually measures the wind by measuring the force of the wind. Um, and then we just correct for atmospheric density and we get the true value of uh, true wind velocity. And then our other anemometers that we used in the summertime was the uh, a regular propeller anemometer and then an ultrasonic anemometer. Um, so we typically try to have at least two anemometers going at once for redundancy. And then ice storms. Ice storms can be pretty insane. Um, these were This was something that I didn't really think much of when I first started at the observatory, uh, but 
that you would just see ridiculous amounts of ice every single year. Um, so our most common type of ice was rime ice, which forms in fog and high winds. And since we're below freezing all the time on the summit and it's always foggy, we spend over 60% of the year in the fog. Um, we see a lot of rime ice basically throughout the entire winter. And the typical day we get one to three inches of ice forming per hour. Um, and that's actual factual. It seems like it's a lot to have one to three inches of ice per hour, but it does happen on a pretty regular basis. Um, our instruments are heated that we leave up in winter up to 5,500 watts, but it does not keep up with the ice accretion, especially in like some of the worst ice storms I was up there for where we were getting up over 12 inches of ice per hour. And then the ice is, has varying density based off of temperature. So this is the picture you see on the right here is why we don't keep anemometers working, uh, the rotating anemometers in the wintertime because ice seizes them up and they stop working and eventually they get torn apart. Um, so this was a glaze ice event. Uh, we got about 16 inches of glaze ice fall in this storm and that was, this is our uh, instrument tower um, and then kind of like a zoomed out view, kind of looks like the ships on the Bering Sea um, end up losing internet with this event since the ice covering our microwave dish was uh, too much and caused it to break. And then there's this of measuring it. So that's about uh, a third of ice on the very top of the tower. And then this is a more of a typical rime ice event where you get the opaque color of the ice and it grows horizontally into the wind. And rime ice accumulates much faster than glaze ice. So this, this amount of ice can occur in only about three to six hours. And then it's not really an ice storm, but one of the challenges we faced in the winter time was when we had a rain on snow event where you could get like two to three inches of rain um, during a nor'easter and it just waterlogs all the snow and it changes the entire summit basically to an entire sheet of ice so getting up and down the mountain in the winter time um, will require uh, special vehicles to be able to not slip off the mountain and also led to issues with uh, search and rescues because people hiking may slip on the snow fields that are now covered in ice and then there's like a long sliding falls. So uh, when uh, there's kind of an elevated um, alertness, I guess, to radio chats and whatnot uh, when we have a rain on snow event and then a freeze afterwards. And then snow and blizzards. Uh, we get 281 inches of snow per year with the highest snow total of 566 inches in the winter of 1968-1969. Um, then that same year also had our biggest snowstorm with 97 inches from February 2nd to 5th. And then the February 1969 was also the snowiest month at 173 inches of snow falling just that month. And we typically experience blizzard conditions for about 800 hours per year. Um, and that's the way I calculated that when I was doing, uh, making statistics for one of our fundraisers was I just used actively falling snow to try to because it was really hard to distinguish from freezing fog and blowing snow what was uh, causing the greatest visibility restrictions. But typically when there's falling snow and high winds, uh, it's the, the blowing snow will restrict visibility more than fog. Uh, so this is getting the precipitation can. I'll speed it up here um, to go a little faster. But this was, I was filming with my GoPro and then the uh, education specialist at the time was getting the precip can in the morning and um, the door here faces off to the east. Um, so typically snow will build up uh, in front of the door and we have to shovel it out and then get out and then carry this uh, uh, can to the, or swap out the precip cans, which is about a hundred yard walk uh, outside. So sometimes when the blizzard conditions are extreme, uh, we don't get the precip can because if we can't see more than a couple feet uh, it's extremely dangerous because you sometimes can't get your way back to the building because with the high winds, you get really disorientated, everything's white, and it's really easy to go the wrong direction. Yeah, once we get out there, just uh, easy, just pull the second can out and then put the new can in and then just walk back towards the door. to get through all the drips. And 
which a lot of times those drifts could only form in a few hours when the wind direction changes. Um, so it does not take long to get buried inside the building. So that was like another common task we had to do all winter long was to uh, be constantly shoveling snow. Um, and then this was a video I took um, during one of the days where we did not go get the precip can due to the blizzard conditions. It was just, uh, the visibility was just too low. That's very easy when conditions like that get disorientated. Then um, now we're heading into ground blizzards. So these were some of the notable, this was probably the most notable ground blizzard event where we had winds sustained over 100 for about 12 hours and it completely scoured all the snow we had on the summit away, leaving us with just ice and rock. Uh, so this was looking out our office space um, down uh, at our snow light. Yeah, so the winds are about uh, uh, sustained at about 100 with gusts to 115 during this video. And then with this video, um, this was the next morning after uh, the entire night of 100 mile an hour winds. Um, this was actually the highest wind speeds I recorded on video, but because the summit doesn't really have much to blow around, it's really hard to actually see the, the wind. Um, so you can just really just hear it. But this was at 122 miles an hour with gusts to 135. But other than like the noise, it looks like a nice morning. Then this was the wind chart for that storm. So uh, winds are sustained between 115 to 120 miles an hour for almost the entire night uh, with frequent gusts to almost 140. We peaked out at 137 miles an hour in this event. Um, but to kind of put in perspective, this storm here was another significant storm we had, but it was only gusting to 120, where in the previous one, uh, winds were sustained at 120 for this event. And then we have a lot of frigid cold temperatures. Um, our average annual temperature is 27 degrees, so spend more time below freezing than not. Um, we typically spend about 280 days per year below freezing on the summit, so not too many days above freezing. Uh, the record low, negative 47, with wind chills regularly falling at 70 below or colder. And then some of my personal records is negative 40 on the February 13th, 2016, which I believe the day after. Um, that here in Binghamton, what they set a record low, uh, I think at negative 18. And then my coldest wind chill was negative 97 on January 6, 2018. Uh, we had the air temperature was negative 37.5 degrees with wind sustained at 107 miles an hour. Um, ironically, during the negative 40, the wind chill was only about negative 80 since the winds were around 40 miles an hour. So pretty light winds. Um, for the cold temperatures we're experiencing. So uh, this was me. This is actually my first week as a full-time staff working the night shift. And three days in, I got to record a temperature down at negative 40, which it was pretty easy to convert to Celsius for the observation at negative 40. Uh, this was one of the windows facing into the wind that same night. Um, so with how cold it is, it's really hard to retain heat in the building. So you get a lot of frost develop on the walls and windows. Um, luckily in the living quarters and the office space, it doesn't look like this, but sections of the building that have less adequate heating, it looks like this almost all winter long. Um, and then in the event where we had the um, negative 97 degree wind chills, our the temperature inside our office fell to 40, uh, 46 degrees um, due to it. The, the cold air contracted the concrete. So there was um, 
a lot of wind blowing through all the cracks and the heaters couldn't keep up with how much heat we were losing the outside. And then here's of course doing the boiling water uh, trick uh, to convert it to steam basically instantaneously. And then one more cold weather experience experiment that we like to do in um, really cold temperatures. Uh, this one's like freezing clothing, so I'll just let it play. Experiment. We're going to take these uh, here. Back the boat. We're going to try and get the freeze to the wind. So, all on the outside, our touches is 22 below zero with our wind. Less than about uh, 80 miles an hour, guessing at the mid 90s. Yeah, so we have wind chills here right around uh, negative 70 uh, during this event with air temperatures uh, 22 below zero. And then wind speeds around 90 miles an hour. Yeah, so in wind chills, this cold frostbite occurs after 30 seconds. So you have to make sure that everything you're wearing, you have no exposed skin um, because you can freeze a pair of pants in about uh, 20 seconds. Then probably like the most fun part of the job was uh, de-icing, but it's probably like the most dangerous. So with how much ice we see, a lot of times we're doing this multiple, uh, usually it's every two to three hours um, and when we have light, lighter grinding conditions, but in situations where we're seeing greater than six inches of ice per hour, uh, we have to go out uh, every 30 minutes to uh, 10 minutes to 30 minutes to get everything off to, so that the instruments continue to record accurate data. Um, so this night, uh, was a night where I didn't sleep well because the winds were really high. So this was a high sustained wind event with 115 mile an hour winds with gusts to 125. And this was a night observer, Caleb Mute, um, give it de-icing the instruments. <laughs> So once you start getting wind speeds that high, we always have two people who come out to do the, to help out with de-icing just in case something happens. But uh, once those wind speeds are, or sustain over 110 miles an hour, you can't really stand up in the circle. So you saw what he did, he just kind of stayed to crouch down and just hit the metal poles as hard as they can to uh, try to knock ice off. And then my favorite snowstorm, or favorite storm while I worked on the summit was one that a lot of people in the Binghamton area will recognize uh, with the March 14th, 2017. Um, the reasons being it snowed a lot, uh, same as here basically, where I think you got the three, three feet fell here and we got just over two feet on the summit. Um, that was what we recorded with the wind speeds. Uh, the winds was from the east, um, which is pretty rare. Uh, we typically have west winds, so it throws a unique challenge and the building's built to handle west winds. So when you have an east wind, um, it's blowing right out all the doors, which uh, makes you think that all the doors are going to break and blow open. Um, but the peak wind gust was 138 and with the gust, your ears would pop. And it was the first storm working on the summit where I felt the building shaking in the wind. 
which the building is two feet thick steel reinforced concrete with bulletproof windows and the fact that it was shaking in the wind is like pretty remarkable and then extreme cold uh the day prior we had a low of negative 35 degrees and then it warmed up with that warm front coming through to i think right around 20 degrees and then it fell back to negative 11 just after the storm so certain off looking at blizzard conditions from uh the main window the main windows in the rotunda And then towards the mid-afternoon, um, we started having, like, I was worried that we were going to have the doors start to blow open from the wind. But... Yeah, so it's extremely loud because there's not as much insulation on the, the east side of the building either. And then one final one before the storm started to calm down. So in this storm, it's actually really difficult to get up in the ice because the ladder to get up to the top of the tower faced east. So once you got halfway up the ladder, you're being completely exposed to the wind. Uh, so it was really hard to, you'd lose your balance. And if you got blown away from the ladder, it's hard to get back. Um, so we didn't really do much de-icing during this storm. But this was what the wind chart ended up looking like uh, with the peak wind gusts from 138 and wind sustained over at 100 miles an hour for two hours in a row with uh, these numbers here. So that's the hourly average and then hourly average wind direction. And then April 16th, 2019 was my day with both my personal records. Um, this day we had ice accumulation at over 12 inches per hour. I did not get any video because it was probably one of the most stressful nights since we were dicing every like 10 to 15 minutes and within five minutes of de-icing, the, um, the wind would drop off, then you de-ice it, go back up to where it is, is, and then drop off again. So there would be times where you'd hear this huge wind gust at the building and it wouldn't be recorded, uh, but this was the gust that was outside up on the tower floor when we hit 137 miles an hour. And then later that evening, we hit 142 miles an hour. And I believe the night observer might have been on the summit during that event. And then finally, it's like with the conditions, like how do you get up and down the mountain? Uh, we use that snowcat. So we owned a snowcat and then the state park, since they also occupied the building year round, also had a snowcat. Uh, snow um, and so on the right side here is our, the Mount Washington Observatory snowcat. And then the left side is uh, the state parks. Um, why we have a white snowcat when we deal with whiteout conditions, I'm not sure. And it has actually led to problems with uh, people getting outside to go look around in the blizzard and then not finding the snow cat walking back towards it because it's white. So the next time you get a snow cat, I think they're going to paint it yellow or something that's much more visible. Um, but some days doing shift change was marvelous where we had we're just after a fresh snow, perfectly blue skies, and it was just like a really fun trip up. But most of the time we're not so lucky. Um, this is more of a typical uh, shift change where visibility is only a few feet and it takes three to six hours to go the eight miles up to the summit um, especially when conditions are this bad um, a lot of times you have to stop and wait for the winds to calm down slightly then you can see the road and you go an inch forward for a little bit and then the winds pick up and the visibility drops back to zero and they have to wait or if if, search, if there's a situation where a search and rescue is required then we and we have to get up to the summit we'll do dope and a rope where 
people tie themselves, one person ties 25 foot rope to one side of the blade with another person to a 25 foot rope on the other side of the blade. And you go forward until you can find each side of the road. And then the snow cat will inch its way up to where you are. And then you find the next 25 feet. So you literally just inch your way up through blizzard conditions um, if there is a search and rescue or um, there's a reason that there could be lives in danger then typically we try to push through really bad weather. And then when there's not enough snow to go up and down the mountain in the snow cat, since it requires at least six inches of snow for, on, across the entire roadway, um, we take a truck and van, um, of course using chains, but it's always kind of sketchy because you're going up over lots of ice and a vehicle with chains on um, with a cliff on one side. So it couldn't be nerve wracking, but we did it all the time. And the drivers that we had were skilled and really never really worried at any point. They're only during the summer months we had to worry a bit more. So during the summer you can go up and down as normal. Um, but with a lot of the with it being open to the public, every once in a while you run into situations like this where someone drives on the incoming side because they're afraid to be near the edge of the road. Um, and that leads to more issues. And most of the car accidents that occurred with like any of the observatory staff or state park staff or auto road staff occurred um, with basically someone being this way and not moving over far enough and then there's a collision or whatnot. And then the funnest way to get off the mountain is skiing. So every now and then I uh, get the perfect snowstorm and you get permission from the auto road who technically owns the road. So it's a private road um, to ski down. Uh, so it's not it's not allowed, but if they're nice and having it at, and you're they're having a nice day or a good day and then you ask them, hey, can I ski down the road uh, for shift change? And they might say yes. So um, there, there was always really fun to be able to ski off the mountain because you get back to your car in a much shorter period of time. Then uh, kind of like the last thing to talk about is the snow wall. So once the uh, accumulating snow season's over, the auto road starts to plow the snow. So throughout the entire winter, the snow cats drive up and over the snow uh, rather than plowing it. And then during the spring, all the snow gets cleared off the, the road. So you get the snow wall. So this was my first year where we actually had a snow wall because my first winter was actually a dud of a year. And it was a 2015, 2016 winter where we didn't get much snow at all. Most of it was rain events. So the, this was 2016, um, uh, 2016, that's spring of 2017 where there was about 12 feet of snow and that's looking from the snow cat looking down to see how far the snow wall goes. Um, the reason this exists is Above treeline, the wind scours all the snow off, and then right at treeline, from about uh, three th or from about four thousand feet to five thousand feet in elevation on the mountain, you would get an insane amount of snow accumulations because that's the first area of friction, and the snow will be deposited there. And then last year, in 2019, was our was probably the biggest snow wall that we end up getting because um, even though this wasn't a very snowy winter. Uh, we only had 30 hours the entire winter season with temperatures above freezing, so we had no melting events. So basically all the snow we had from um, November to uh, April when this picture was taken uh, was still on the mountain. So there's me and my coworkers standing underneath it. So we end up with about 20 feet of snow with this snow wall. And then just kind of going to random pictures of other happenings that occurred on the summit. So. This is my poor attempt at taking pictures of the Northern Lights, uh, which occurred uh, probably about a dozen times per year, but we're not always in the clear. But luckily one of my coworkers, they are much better at taking pictures than I am. And they're basically a professional photographer. So this was like the same Aurora, where with a cell phone, it's kind of lackluster, but with an actual camera, you actually see all the pillars and the lights and everything. On rare circumstances, you had a snowfall with no wind on the summit. so. We got about six inches of snow here, and this actually occurred in May. So this was uh, mid-May when this had happened, and that, that's more common is to have snowless or windless snows in, in the springtime when you get early season convection and it just forms over the summit and you get just a stationary um, snowstorm right on the summit for a couple hours. And then getting out um, for exercise in the the winter can always be a challenge. Um, so some days where you have clear skies, but maybe still high winds, I'll go for a hike up and down the auto road. 
Um, but this was a cool shot of a lot of the blowing snow we were having along with lenticular clouds forming below the summit. Uh, and then damage does occur. So uh, we lost our internet one day, um, actually with that same event uh, with the blizzard that I showed you where we had the 12 hours of wind sustained over 100, um, we lost our internet for a while and at least it was pretty easy to troubleshoot this. Um, but it was really cool, neat to see it actually break the hardware. Usually it breaks the wood that we screwed into, but this actually sheared off the bolt that was holding the um, the pole in place for the uh, microwave, the, the internet connection. And then another unique thing that occurs on the summit is flooding. Um, even though we're like the highest point in the Northeast, uh, during rain on snow events, um, the the really cold snow will freeze the liquid water. So you kind of get all the rain that is falling will run over the top of the snowpack. And then with the way the snow drifts around the building, it kind of acts like a dam. So the water will just kind of fill up as a reservoir and then start flowing into the building. So we had to deal with flooding a lot. And then we can see our uh, flamethrower on the bench on the side. And that was actually used to melt our way out of the buildings because with the ice storms, sometimes all the doors freeze shut and they have to have a way to get out. So the flamethrower is used to melt all the ice off the doors and the frames. So that way the door will open. And then just random snow pictures. So this was a uh, picture after an upslope snow event where we had four days of snow and we ended up recording 40 inches of snow those four days. Um, but it's just pretty neat to see that most of the rocks that we had on some of the other mountains were completely buried by the snow. And then the famous Tuckerman's Ravine. Um, this was the downwind of the summit uh, from the prominent wind direction. So this was the most likely area for snow to accumulate and it was a big uh, bowl a uh, big glacial, glacial cirque that was on the eastern side of the mountain range um, that can fill with snow. In fact, some of the snow measurements from the base of the bowl here can exceed 900 inches of snow. So the snow, this would be the last place snow would melt and a lot of times it lasted till uh, late July and early August. And then of course, a lot of people want to know about the cat. So this is Marty the cat observing precip um, and he's a main, black Maine coon and has lived on the summit for eight years. Uh, cats have been a part of the observatory since uh, started in 1932, originally for rodent control, but as better building codes have come around, um, their buildings aren't as susceptible to rodents. So now it's just there for, he's just there for tradition. So there is, is in our gift shop, uh, making sure, doing some quality control there. Um, but yeah, that's my, my slideshow. So I can open up for any questions, feel free to type them out and I can answer them to the best of my ability. Yeah, I'll just leave up some of like the, the means and extremes page here just that so you can see some of the other records while I wait for any questions. Let's see here. Looks like I'm getting some. Let me read through them. All right, so does weather on the mountain impact the east coast of uh, the weather on the east coast and it actually does have a pretty good impact um, a lot of the times as we have the wind flow up and over the mountain range you can get mountain waves that will generate precipitation or clearing downwind of the summit um, other aspects is uh, flooding so the terrain the terrain can block weather if you have an east or southeast wind coming off the coast and create a heavy rainfall event on the east side which has led to flooding events uh, in the recent past um, as well as um, when you do have those rain on snow events, then the, if you do have them last for more than a few hours, that can melt the snow plus the falling rain and you can get really high rivers in a very short period of time. So it is really nice to have a point of observation at the headwaters. So it's really great for hydrology. All right, let's see. How is it in, let's see. 
All right, so how was it encountering people at random time and has anyone showed up desperate for help? Uh, that happens a lot. It actually happens way more often in the summertime um, where you, it is open to the public. So a lot of times people will hike up after dark thinking the building's still open or expecting to, to be able to have one of their significant others or one of their friends drive up to the mountain and drive them off. But when it's like nine o'clock at night and they're tired and not prepared, they a lot of times are knocking on the door. Um, and the state park does keep EMTs up on the summit at all times. So a lot of times they are physically assessed to make sure that they're okay, there's nothing significant, but if they are fine, um, they, ha they have to hike down the road. So they're, if they don't have a flashlight, a lot of times there's like $1 like dollar store flashlights that they're given um, and then given a map on how to walk down the road. Um, but if there is a situa situation where they're hypothermic or um, injured, which happens a lot in the wintertime, where typically if someone knocks on the door in the wintertime, they're more prepared and if they're knocking, on the door, then that usually means something's gone wrong. All right, like there's times where people had broken arms knocking on the door, um, really bad frostbite on their face because they weren't wearing a uh, face covering and extreme wind chills. So in those situations, we usually bring them inside, try to warm them up the best of our ability, and then take to start the 12 hour process of getting them off the mountain. So unfortunately it takes a really long time to get people down. Let's see. So we, for what do we do for food to, if we can't get off the mountain? Um, we have a large supply. So we have a huge chest freezer on the summit and then a lot of canned goods. So we have about three months worth of food when I worked up there at any given time. Um, but you did run out of fresh food pretty fast. So um, every once in a while you'll have, um, you'll have to, the, food will freeze in the snow cap on its way up. So all the fresh food is ruined, especially like the fresh food and vegetables ruined before it even gets to the top. So then you have to have canned food the entire week. So that does happen a lot. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, that's chasing hikers off after dark happens, still happens to this day. <laughs> uh, let's see, wildlife. So what wildlife is in the area? Um, we didn't have too much in the way of wildlife on the summit. Uh, it was largely just small rodents. Um, we did have pine martens on the summit, um, but the biggest mammal I saw was a fox. So we sometimes would have a fox visit the summit in the summertime, but in the wintertime, you mainly just had ravens and birds. Um, you didn't even have really any rodents or anything like that. You only had to deal with mice and whatnot for a pretty short period of time in late October, and early November when it really started to cool off. Uh, but we did have a moose on the summit once, so that, but that was in the 1980s. Um, but so that's pretty rare to have large animals make it up to the top. And let's see. All right, so that's all the questions for now. I'll wait a few more minutes um, before I end the session here, since we've only got a couple more minutes left of the hour here. Yeah, but uh, I guess I go on with like the, oh, how long was your, yeah, how long was my internship? So I did uh, a six month internship actually at the summit. So I did the fall fall and winter seasons. Um, so right after I graduated from the University of North Dakota, I uh, got the fall internship at the observatory and then did that for about six months. And then after six months, a job position opened up on the summit and I applied for it and was luckily able to get it. And then I worked up there ever since until I moved here in January. All right, so that's that's about it that I have for me. Um, thanks a lot for everyone who joined. Um, I hope you learned something and got something out of it. I hope the videos went through well. So uh, thanks a lot for joining and uh, have a great evening, everyone.